There is nothing more tantalizing to the human species than a good mystery. Thrillers in the forms of novels, movies, and even campfire tales are often consumed by the thousands who love the adrenaline rush of solving a mystery. However, some of the most pervasive mysteries are those that occur in real life, and these are the ones that are often most difficult to solve. So today, here at Unexplained Mysteries, we'll be taking a look at mysterious discoveries. Palpa Flat Mountain Seen as one of the most convincing pieces of evidence for that of ancient civilizations having once possessed advanced technologies is that of the archaeological discovery of the Palpa Flat Mountain. Ancient astronaut theorists have often posited that perhaps the gods of ancient cultures that supposedly descended from the stars were not actually gods but rather advanced alien life forms. This would make sense given the fact that many cultures directly write about how the gods came from the stars or on machines that could fly. Interestingly enough, the ancient Nazca tribes also seem to hold a similar belief to their religion and the evidence in the area only shows this further that it could very well be the case. As many different pilots flew over the area of the ancient tribes, a shocking discovery was made in regards to what they could see from the sky. Lines drawn out in the desert were made visible from the sky that appeared to be created over many miles of distance. In fact, the lines were detailed images and navigation trails that would have helped possible aircraft find areas to land and travel to. This was made only more interesting as located nearby these large creations is that of the Palpa Flat Mountain. Located on the Palpa Flat Mountain is a completely flat mountainside as if flattened down by vast ancient technologies. This is made more peculiar as it seems to be the only flat mountain in the region with a top that looks artificially cut from its base. Located on this flat top are lines and creations that pilots have often mistaken for a landing strip for aircraft. This has led many of the ancient astronaut theorist communities to believe that perhaps the tribe helped their gods by creating these lines in the sand that were only visible from the skies. These lines could be used similar to that as modern-day concrete arrows used to point towards landing strips and other aviation important signals. This would be a plausible explanation as the lines on the ground are not visible and would not be able to be used religiously or for any other important purpose without the ability to see it from the sky. Interestingly enough, the lines seem to be very old and ancient and provide proof as to the tribe's advanced knowledge in geometry in order to create massive images in the sand that they could never see themselves. Additionally, these pieces appear to be images of things the tribes held with utmost importance, such as that of different kinds of animal life and strange symbols that are nearly impossible to understand. Today, experts have no explanation as to the cause for the creation of the lines or the purpose they serve outside of both a religious connotation and assistance in aviation. Not an island, but a sinkhole. Welcome to Oak Island. You have just arrived on a piece of privately owned land that is densely covered with trees along the south shore of Nova Scotia. As you start exploring, you might note how explorers such as yourself have been passionately investigating, hunting and excavating for treasure since the late 1700s. However, that might not be the precedent going into the future. Why so? That is because, according to a retired geologist, Stephen Aitken, Oak Island's money pit is doomed to sink in the future. After spending decades of his life in the oil business, he applied his knowledge to the land and came up with the startling conclusion. Instead of finding the treasure that people have been searching for for over 200 years, he realized that he was standing on a sinkhole. Upon venturing out to the notorious pit, he first took note of the bedrock that it was built upon. It was made of limestone and gypsum, which under the right conditions of temperature, pressure and poor fluid composition would be at great risk of disintegration. 
Could that mean that the money pit contains underwater caves which would collapse? According to Aitken, that is exactly correct. Once the rocks collapse, you are left with a bedrock cavity. In fact, the geological evidence that the scientists studied has already suggested that the cave's roof had already fallen apart. Throughout all the tunnels and pits that have formed, that also proves the existence of many other sinkholes nearby that have formed naturally over thousands to millions of years. With such stunning geological evidence, perhaps the real treasure is not the gold or the jewels that mystery hunters fantasize about, but the archaeological artifacts worth discovering. They could potentially open the doors to fascinating knowledge about the rich history that has taken place on the island, whether it involves farming, logging, shipbuilding, or more. Just to be sure to grab hold of this treasure before it collapses into a sinkhole. The Spanish Coin Humans have only set foot on the island for about 200 years. There could not be any artifacts older than that, right? Well, the Spanish coin might just prove you wrong. In 1965, a group of hopeful students from the Phillips Academy in Andover, USA, began an expedition led by a man named Peter Beamish, who was famously known to have found over 1,000 artifacts throughout his hunts in a one-year period. What they stumbled upon was a coin, but not just any other old copper penny or pence that another traveller might have dropped. They picked up an 11 Maravedi, otherwise known as a quarter reel. This special coin began production shortly after the Americas were first discovered all the way back in 1492. At the time, copper Maravedis and silver reels were starting to become minted for the use of new Spanish colonies and were specially designed to indicate that they were colonial money. At around 1505, a majority of these coins were minted in Seville and shipped to the island of Hispaniola, where they would then make their way to the colonies as cargo aboard the infamous Spanish treasure fleet. The specific Spanish 11 Maravedi that was found off the coast of the island was verified to have been made in 1598. However, two emerging theories have resulted about how this one coin ended up so far away from the colonies of its intended destination. For one, the coin might have simply fallen off the treasure fleet and swam alongside the tide to eventually wash up upon the island. Who knows if it was a sailor that casually flicked it into the ocean or if it just tumbled off of a treasure chest that was being pushed around. Another speculating theory was that the Spanish explorers became greedy and wanted to hide a portion of the treasure trove instead of handing it all over to the king. Perhaps they made a pit stop at the island and hastily buried it with the intention of digging it back up later. Did those sailors ever return? Could there still be a whole treasure trove out there that is waiting to see the light of day again? Or is the coin all that is left of the vast riches rumoured to be underground? Whatever it is, it is nothing short of a compelling mystery waiting to be explored. British Company Finds Atlantis in Spain The most damning evidence against the existence of Atlantis is the clear lack of physical remnants of the so-called city. Surely, if such a powerful island nation were to exist, then records, pieces or artefacts from such a place would still be around somewhere, just waiting to be found. In November 2018, a British company claimed to have done just that. A British satellite firm named Merlin Burroughs stated in 2018 that they had discovered images that could show remnants of the long-lost city written by Plato around 2,400 years ago. Merlin Burroughs points towards supposed ruins that lie in Doñana National Park in Spain. According to their claims, there is evidence of concrete which could be between 10,000 and 12,000 years old. After first being written about by the philosopher Plato, the city of Atlantis has garnered a reputation of being in control of advanced alien technology, which was supposedly lost to time and to the ocean. Because of this, efforts to find the supposedly lost city have grown in frequency, with many people across the globe trying to find its location. Bruce Blackburn, a representative from Merlin Burroughs, stated, We've got a body of evidence that we've presented, and we have a whole host of proof points, and we are quite happy for people to take a viewpoint. Continuing on, 
Blackburn said, We've released this information, we've got some films, and we accept that there will be people who think it isn't true. Merlin Burroughs decided on their spot by using satellite data alongside descriptions of Atlantis given to us by Plato. The location pinpointed by the firm is claimed to match those descriptions laid out by Plato, and is reinforced by the presence of what they describe as concrete. Being 10,000 years old, the site does match the time frame of Atlantis's supposed existence given by Plato. Furthermore, Merlin Burroughs asserts that they discovered what appears to be ruins of ancient towers and a temple, again supposedly matching descriptions penned by Plato and other ancient texts. While the discovery sounds exciting, some scientists don't believe it. Of course, the finding is still exciting to some. Perhaps the discovery is man-made after all, and points to an archaeological discovery that has gone unnoticed. Or perhaps we're looking for something that just isn't there. What did Plato say about Atlantis? As we mentioned in the section before, the first person to write about Atlantis was actually the famous philosopher Plato. Known for his massively influential philosophical teachings, most famously his cave allegory, Plato shaped thousands of years of Western philosophy and countless historical figures after he passed away. But many do not realise that he is the author of, or at least the first author to mention, Atlantis. The reason behind Plato's Atlantis was used as a way to explain his philosophical beliefs through a pseudo-historical retelling of history. Atlantis was supposed to show the resilience of Athens against an aggressor, and was supposed to be a parable of what Plato believed to be the ideal state. In his story, Plato details that Athens defends itself from Atlantis in an amazing display. Athens, which represents Plato's concepts on running a state, decimated Atlantis before the island is disregarded by the Grecian deities and sinks into the ocean. Atlantis, as described by Plato around 360 BC, was an incredible advanced island civilization. Those who first founded the land were demigods, half god and half human. The island nation was considered a utopia and had an unprecedented amount of maritime power. The island nation was told to have been made up of multiple islands that were split by moats and that were linked together by a canal that stretched to the centre of Atlantis. The islands were described as beautiful and full of natural resources. Supposedly, Atlantis was full of rare metals like gold and silver, exotic elephants, and even orichalcum, which is an unknown resource of mythical quality. The city we associated with Atlantis was the capital and was formed on the central island. The central island held mountains in its northwest region with three variations of rock-coloured red, black and white. The land was rich and fertile, with many farms and croplands growing abundant fruit, vegetables and herbs. It is important to say that Plato did not intend for Atlantis to become such a well-known representation of lost civilizations. In fact, in relation to Plato's work, Atlantis is relatively unimportant. This has not stopped the city becoming a piece of popular culture, in fact, in modern times, Atlantis has an influence on countless video games, movies, comics, and books. Scientists find evidence of ancient Denisovans on Tibetan Plateau. In late 2020, an expansion of research into the Denisovans took place, revealing more about the subspecies of archaic humans. For a little over a decade, we have known about the existence of the Denisovans, a now extinct species biologically and evolutionarily related to both modern-day humans and the Neanderthals. Bone fragments found in the Denisova cave, hence their name, underwent genome sequencing and other genetic tests to confirm their place in the evolutionary timeline of humans. However, outside of the Denisova cave, located in the Altai Mountains in Siberia, Scientists have struggled to find evidence further confirming their existence or societal patterns and behaviours. That is, until new research began to emerge. 
In late 2020, research published within the journal Science presented a hypothesis that the Denisovans spread their presence throughout Asia over a broad basis, having relations with human ancestors to people living within 21st century Asia. This idea is based upon the premise that the Denisovans diverged from the Neanderthals about 400,000 years ago. The evidence for these assumptions is rooted in the remains of DNA found within the sedimentary rocks of cave walls. These caves underwent excavation, allowing the sediments to be removed and analysed. From the entrance to the Bashir Cast Cave, Bashir Cast Cave is a limestone cavern situated on the northeast of the Tibetan Plateau, known as the Roof of the World due to its high elevation. The characteristic genetic mutations found within Denisovan humans were present in the genetic analysis, providing evidence that the Denisovans had been within Asia. Co-author Charles Perrault, associate professor at the School of Human Evolution and Social Change at Arizona State University, and his research team found over 1,300 artifacts and 580 bone fragments during this project. This has given an insight into the abilities of the groups, as many of these artifacts were composed of flaked sandstone and hornstone river cobbles, whilst the bones from gazelles, foxes, rhinoceros and other animals give an insight into the surroundings and wildlife. Markers such as wildlife can be assessed as useful, as flowing water has the ability to distort where sediments may lie. However, we do currently consider the Denisovans to have been genetically adapted in some manner to survive at high altitudes, such as those presented on the Tibetan Plateau with relative ease. The modern-day ability for many Tibetans to survive in these high altitudes provides a tenuous link to the development of modern humans in the area. We cannot know if the Denisovans and modern-day Asian populations are more closely genetically linked than, say, Europeans just yet though the current research suggests this possibility is not too far-fetched. Archaeological research is continuing to progress in leaps and bounds. It is astonishing how little we know and how much there is to discover about our very own pasts. Mysterious geoglyphs reveal Amazon was densely populated. Once thought to be an untouched paradise, the pre-Columbian Amazon may have actually been home to millions of people. Until recently, it was assumed that the Amazon was a pristine paradise with only a few groups of nomadic people living around the Amazon River to sustain themselves. New research in the Brazilian state of Mato Grosso suggests a new story entirely. As it turns out, the rainforest could have actually been home to millions living in large interconnected villages. With much of the region covered in dense forest, the area has always been challenging to navigate for any archaeologist interested in finding out more about how Amazonians lived away from the river and its resources. Using satellite imagery, teams were able to identify geoglyphs, which are ancient geometric ground drawings made by humans out of the earth, stone and low-relief mounds, presumably part of a ritual for the gods, especially in times of drought. Once they had the geoglyphs, the team went into the field to the precise locations to see if they could actually find any remnants of ancient civilizations there. They were overjoyed when all 24 areas they visited contained some form of proof that people had lived there. In one site, they found old ceramics estimated to be from 1410 AD. After returning to their labs, they then used their findings to predict the locations of other possible sites, which revealed there are likely 1,300 villages and geoglyphs in the 154,000 square mile area of southern Amazonia, two-thirds of which have yet to be found. The research team now believes that between 500,000 and 1 million people once lived in a mere 7% of the Amazon basin. Prior to this research, it was estimated that the entire basin had only ever been home to 2 million people. The possibility of there being even more sites suggests that these interconnected villages spanned over 1,100 miles during their peak years between 1200 and 1500 AD. It appears that there are more discoveries to be found in the Amazon. Reports of Huge Snakes In 1959, Belgian Air Force Colonel Remy van Lierde spotted something rather peculiar as he flew over the forests of the Democratic Republic of Congo. 
Van Lierd served at the Kamina Air Base, located in Congo, which was, at the time, occupied by Belgium. The colonel had been going home by helicopter after a mission flying over the Katanga region, when he spotted what he described as a huge snake lurking within the forests. The description he gave of the snake was terrifying, to say the least, with Van Lierd describing it as reaching 50 feet long, with a head approximately 2 feet in width and 3 feet in length. He also mentioned the head being a triangular shape. If these figures are correct, these hidden snakes earn a rank amongst the longest snakes to live in all the history we have accessible. Regarding color, this mysterious, large snake reportedly has green and brown scales on top but has a white underside. This encounter was short-lived, however, as Van Lierd and his pilot were mid-flight. The team, upon Lierd's request, made a U-turn circling round to take another look at this alleged giant snake. Upon the team returning, the snake, assumed to be defending territory, reared his upper half. This stance was assumed to indicate he was ready to strike as a result of the team's nosy impositions. Regardless, this lifted pose clued Van Lierd in as to the snake having a white coloured underneath. Due to the low nature of the helicopter and the aggressive position of the snake, Van Lierd commanded for the flight to continue, not hanging around long enough for trouble to come, leaving this peculiar snake behind without making any specific documentation of it. Some suggest that the photographer aboard managed to capture a relatively blurred image of this curious creature, though it has been difficult to definitively trace back to those travelling with Lierd. Mostly, people assume that this snake is a vastly oversized African rock python, a product of evolution from descent of the giant Eocene snake Gigantophis, or perhaps this is a new species of snake altogether. We cannot know for certain. The Disappearance of Rosalind Ballingal Rosalind Ballingal was born in 1948 in northern Rhodesia to British parents, but her family moved to live in South Africa, living for a short time in Johannesburg. By 1968, Rosalind was studying speech and drama at the University of Cape Town. In August 1969, she was staying with two friends in Nisa Forest, when she walked off and never returned. She was known to be a hippie and allegedly the high priestess in a group that referred to themselves as the Cosmic Butterfly. Her disappearance sparked a two-week-long search, which proved to be fruitless, although it did bring up some other interesting information. There was an unidentified body discovered in the search, police files went missing, and there have since been some unconfirmed sightings of Rosalind around the place where she used to live, in the Devotokant area of Cape Town. Albert Grundling of the Department of History at Stellenbosch University said the following, She was a marginal figure on the fringes of society, yet as an observer she also provided a lens through which wider developments could be observed. Albert became aware of Rosalind's story after a guide had mentioned her to him and his wife while touring the Nisa forest. He then saw a picture of her from the Scope magazine back at the Barrydale Hotel. This piqued his curiosity and he began to conduct his own research. He travelled to the local library and began to dig through old documents relating to the case. In the 1980s, the police officially declared Rosalind dead, and the search was called off. One theory is that she may have taken her own life. Grundling's research led him on a path to discover that Rosalind was a striking figure physically, but described as being insecure, depressed and neurotic, and obsessed with the end of the world. Exactly what happened to Rosalind still remains a mystery, but her case still continues to intrigue researchers to this day. Derek J. Luking Don't try to follow me. Those are the final words of 24-year-old Derek J. Luking. Found scribbled on a note in Luking's abandoned car, it is the final piece of evidence in his strange disappearance. Liu King grew up in Virginia before moving to Knoxville, Tennessee, to attend college at Johnson University. After graduating, he took a job as an orderly at Peninsula Behavioral Health Center. Described by his roommate as having a servant heart, 
It raised a red flag when Liu Qing failed to show up for work on the morning of March 15, 2012. This uncharacteristic behavior caused Liu Qing's family to leave Virginia for Tennessee to look for him immediately. A quick search of his computer found searches for the nearby Smoky Mountain National Park as well as reservations for a hotel. The hotel, located in Cherokee, North Carolina, had footage of Liu Qing leaving his room on March 17th, two days after he failed to show up for work. Inside the hotel room, Liu Qing left a Bible and a bottle of alcohol. Determined to find him, Liu Qing's family set out to search the area for themselves. By accident, the family came upon Liu Qing's abandoned Ford Escape. The vehicle was in the newfound Gap parking area, located along the border of Tennessee and North Carolina. Contents of the vehicle seemed to suggest Liu Qing had plans of a long hike or even camping. With him, he had a pickaxe, compass, lamp, pocket knife, knife sharpener, tent, sleeping bag, 100 feet of black parachute cord, granola bars, and a survival belt containing a multi-tool, flashlight, and a fire starter. There were also pages from a military survival guide, along with his wallet still full of cash. The last clue was the note. Don't follow me. Some assume this was a sure sign that Liu Qing was planning on leaving and never returning. Liu Qing's father noted that his behavior had changed recently. Liu Qing began smoking and drinking. He complained about where he was in life and about being unsatisfied with his job. His family was firm, however, that Liu Qing was not depressed and would not kill himself. Ignoring the note's request, search and rescue teams began to search the woods in the newfound Gap area. Interviews with hikers in the area turned up nothing. Even though it was a beautiful day and the park was busy, no one remembered seeing Liu Qing. This led investigators to believe that Liu Qing had either avoided the crowds intentionally or left the trail almost as soon as he stepped foot on it. Trails in the area are well marked, but it is incredibly easy to get lost if someone ventures off of them. Search teams scoured the woods, looking for any sign of Liu Qing. There were no obvious signs of his presence. Many searches led to rhododendron thickets that he could not have passed through without obvious evidence of him being there. Some believe Liu Qing went missing while scouting the trail, fully intending to come back for his gear. Others think he planned to take his own life, but the purchase of nearly $1,000 in camping gear would prove frivolous if this was his intention all along. So what happened to Derek Liu Qing? Why did he have an arsenal of outdoor gear but didn't bring it with him onto the trails? Did he write the simple four-word note indicating he had no intention of returning? The search for Derek Liu Qing is not over. Despite years of searching, no sign of him has ever shown up. Steve Fawcett Steve Fawcett loved the extraordinary. Born in 1944 in Tennessee and raised in Southern California, Fawcett developed an aptitude for extreme sports. A financial advisor by trade, Fawcett used his massive fortune to fund his many record-breaking, continent-crossing and death-defying flights, sailing adventures and hot air balloon circumnavigations. He was a friend of billionaire Richard Branson, who frequently funded Fawcett's extreme adventures under his Virgin Global brand. But Fawcett's life wasn't brought to a close during one of his headline-grabbing world record attempts. Instead, Steve Fawcett met his end during a routine, relaxed solo flight on September 3, 2007. Fawcett took off from a private airstrip near Smith Valley, Nevada in the early morning hours of September 3, 2007. He piloted a single-engine Super Decathlon light aircraft that he had flown many times before without issue. However, six hours after takeoff, flight controllers sounded the alarm with the relevant authorities that Fawcett had not returned as scheduled. A massive search commenced, covering nearly 20,000 square miles of the Sierra Nevada mountain range. The Sierra Nevadas are known for being extremely rocky and inaccessible in many areas so most of the search had to be done by federal aircraft dispatched by the Federal Aviation Authority and local law enforcement. Richard Branson donated funds to aid the search, as well as hotel magnate Baron Hilton, who owned the airstrip that Fawcett had taken off from. 
The search spanned multiple law enforcement agencies as well as private volunteer groups and was estimated to have cost nearly $2 million. At the time, it was the largest federal recovery effort launched in the history of the United States. Despite the magnitude of the search, Fawcett was never found and was legally declared dead mere weeks later. However, nearly a year to the day of Fawcett's disappearance, a hiker camped out in the remote area of the Sierra Nevada range stumbled upon what looked to be identification cards. Upon further inspection, the cards turned out to be Fawcett's driver's license and his Federal Aviation Authority identification. An air search was quickly launched, with planes scouring the area within hours of the hiker's discovery. Steve Fawcett's plane was found about 750 yards away from where his IDs were found, with investigators confirming the plane as Fawcett's based on the tail fin numbers of the plane. A search and rescue team made their way on foot to the site and eventually located two large bones at the crash site. Forensic analysis would later conclude that the bones did indeed belong to Fawcett, and the case was closed. So why would a crash like this happen to such an experienced pilot during a routine flight? Meteorologists would later conduct simulations of the weather patterns that were forecasted for that fateful day in September and concluded that excessive downdrafts around the mountain ridge were too powerful for the small prop plane to handle and forced Fawcett's plane to smash into the side of the ridge just below the peak of the mountain top. George Pinker Yosemite National Park is famous for its amazing waterfalls, deep valleys, and ancient sycamore trees. Located in the Sierra Nevada Mountains in Central California, the park draws 4 million visitors every single year. On Friday, June the 17th, 2011, 80 people from a church in Hawthorne, California were visiting the park. 20 of them, including 30-year-old George Penker, decided to make the hike to Upper Yosemite Falls. The hike to Upper Yosemite Falls offers fantastic views on its way to the view of the tallest waterfall in the United States. The trail is somewhat strenuous, with a steep fall to one side. Although the trail is not the easiest, it is said the payoff at the top is worth it. Once at the top, the group disbanded to allow everyone a chance to explore and return to the trailhead at their leisure. Penker's friends assume he had taken the trail back down alone and therefore did not report him missing until 9pm. Penker was last seen wearing grey sweatpants with white stripes, a black t-shirt that says D and B, along with a blue cloth bag. Searches for Penker started almost immediately, with full-fledged searches beginning the following morning. In all, 105 people, a helicopter and six dogs were all involved in the search. Fellow churchgoers stated that Penker was in good spirits on the whole trail and seemed to make the hike without much trouble, though no one could pinpoint where they saw him last. The National Park Service website states the following about the trails. Do not stray off of the maintained path, as you will find steep drops adjacent to the trail. The upper half of the trail is steep and rocky, but the arduous climb is well worth the amazing views you will be rewarded with at the top. It is easy to believe Penker found himself off the trail resulting in a quick fall to his assumed death. Due to the dangerous conditions and the lack of any evidence tied to Penker, searches were scaled back for the safety of those searching. Sadly, in all the years searching for Penker, not a shred of evidence has turned up, not a piece of clothing nor his blue bag. It is still widely believed Penker perished just off the trail, again proving that although beautiful, national parks can turn into death traps if you are not careful. The Disappearance of Claudia Lawrence Claudia Lawrence was born and raised in North Yorkshire and worked as a chef for the University of York. Lawrence has not been seen since Wednesday the 18th of March 2009 and her disappearance remains a mystery. On that fateful Wednesday, Lawrence left work at 2.30pm and began walking home. On the walk, she was spotted by a friend who offered her a lift and dropped her off at her cottage on Heworth Road at approximately 2.50pm. She was seen posting a letter nearby and then returned home at roughly 3.05pm. 
At around 8 p.m., she texted a friend and accepted a phone call from her mother, in which she was described as sounding cheerful and relaxed. When Lawrence failed to turn up for work the next morning, her manager attempted to call her mobile phone but did not receive an answer. At the same time, evidence shows Lawrence's phone was turned on, only to be switched off deliberately at 12.08 p.m. that same day. Lawrence was due to meet her friend Susie Cooper that evening, but did not turn up. Cooper thought the behavior was out of Lawrence's character and so contacted Lawrence's father, who broke into her flat. The only items that were missing from Lawrence's home were her rucksack, her mobile phone, and her work uniform. This suggested that Lawrence had left for work that morning. The group decided to contact the police and a missing persons investigation began. An appeal was released for any further information on Lawrence's last sightings and led to two reported potential sightings of Lawrence. The first report came from a cyclist who saw a woman who resembled Lawrence with a man at 5.35am on the 19th at Melrose Gate on Lawrence's commute to work. The second sighting was 30 minutes after this when a commuter noticed a couple who looked like they were arguing outside the University of York, Lawrence's place of work. Additionally, police covered CCTV footage of a suspicious-looking man at the back of Lawrence's house on the evening of the 18th and the early morning of the 19th. The man in the CCTV footage was described as wearing a black hoodie, just as the males in the reported sightings had been. Just five weeks into the investigation, police formally classified the case as a suspected murder. Despite over a thousand statements and searches taking place in the investigation, this male figure has never been unmasked. In 2013, the North Yorkshire Police set up a new unit specifically to look into kidnaps and stalled cases. Lawrence's case fell into the latter category. Using new and advanced techniques, the police were able to find additional fingerprints and a man's DNA on a cigarette end in Lawrence's car. The new discovery led to the arrests of six men. However, none were charged. With no conclusion to the case, the two main theories of what happened to Lawrence are that she absconded from the UK or she was abducted and killed. The first theory, that Lawrence absconded, is based on the knowledge that Lawrence had visited Cyprus on five occasions before her disappearance. The last text message on her phone had come from a male friend in Cyprus. This had led some to conclude that Lawrence chose to disappear of her own accord to the Mediterranean island. However, when the police extended the search for Lawrence to Cyprus, no further information of her whereabouts was revealed. The second and dominant theory is that Lawrence was abducted and killed. On a crime watch program focused on her disappearance, Detective Superintendent Ray Galloway revealed that some of Lawrence's relationships had an element of complexity and mystery to them that were not known to her family or friends. Stories began to spread that Lawrence had pursued relationships with married men. Despite her family and friends publicly refuting the claims, some began to suspect that Lawrence had fallen victim to foul play from one of her scorned lovers. This is supported by the fact that police interviewed every male regular of one York pub as to whether they had a romantic relationship with Lawrence. Others argue that it was convicted woman killer Christopher Halliwell who is responsible for Lawrence's abduction. Halliwell abducted and killed his second known victim exactly two years after Lawrence's disappearance. Psychological research has shown that killers are triggered often by dates, so Lawrence's disappearance would fit into his offending pattern and there is one reported sighting of Lawrence and Halliwell together. Lawrence's own mother believes Halliwell is responsible for her daughter's disappearance. She has publicly criticized the police for not spending more money and time investigating whether Halliwell was responsible for the crime. Over ten years later, what happened to Lawrence remains unanswered. The Disappearance of the Beaumont Children On January 26, 1966, nine-year-old Jane Beaumont, seven-year-old Anna Beaumont and four-year-old Grant Beaumont got on a bus to go to Glenelg Beach from their home in Adelaide. The three children never returned home. This is still one of Australia's greatest mysteries to date. Their mother, Nancy, began to worry when the children didn't return by 1pm, and that worry grew stronger as buses returned from the beach without her children. Their father, Jim, had been away on a business trip. He returned home early that afternoon to surprise his family, but when he returned to the news of his missing children, he searched the whole area and finally went to the police. 
An elderly couple told the police they saw the children playing with a man on the beach. They described him as tall, blonde and thin, and said he may have been in his thirties. Jane was known as a shy girl who was very protective of her siblings. The fact that she would play with this man shocked everyone, leading police to believe the children must have met the man before that day. Nancy remembered Anna telling her before that Jane had a boyfriend at the beach, but she didn't take it seriously at the time. Other witnesses reported that this man had been watching the children before he started playing with them. Later, he went around asking if anyone had seen the children's missing money. Some later saw the children leaving the beach with this man. Police believe he may have taken their money so he could offer them help later. He could have offered to take them home so they would see him as a sort of hero and they would trust him. Not long after they left the beach, the children at a local cake shop buying pastries and a meat pie. Their parents didn't believe the children would want to buy a meat pie because they would rather buy sweets. This also cost more money than their mother gave them that morning. It was assumed that the man they left with gave them the money and they got the meat pie for him. Descriptions of the children were released to the public and the police received more information and reported sightings than they could deal with. All the information led them to believe the children had been kidnapped, they were hiding or they had been in some sort of accident and perhaps drowned to death. Police searched the beach and storm drains nearby, and they drained the harbour to investigate it better. Nothing was ever discovered, however, and they had no new evidence to work with. That November, a Dutch clairvoyant named Gerard Croisset went to Adelaide after he claimed he had a vision of where their children were buried. Everyone, including Jim and Nancy, were eager about his arrival and believed he had the answers they were looking for. He led search teams to an abandoned warehouse, but nothing was found there. The case was never closed, but what really happened that day is still a mystery. After the disappearance of the Beaumont children, parents everywhere grew more cautious about letting their children go out alone. It became more and more clear that danger could be anywhere. The Disappearance of Keith Reinhard The tiny village of Silver Plume in Colorado has a population of just over 200. It was the location solitude that enticed Keith Reinhardt in 1988 to take a three-month sabbatical from his job as a sports writer, leave his wife and family and get some much-needed respite and work on his novel. Reinhardt also saw the tiny village, which boasted mountainous areas, as an opportunity to overcome his lifelong fear of heights and get in better shape. When he arrived in Silver Plume, he leased a small shop to sell antiques and photographs to maintain him financially. It was then that Reinhard learned about the previous owner of the shop, a man called Tom Young, who on July 31st of the previous year went for a walk with his dog and never returned. A month into Reinhard's stay at Silver Plume, the bodies of Young and his dog were found propped against a tree in the wilderness. Both had been shot dead. Since Young had purchased a gun several days before he disappeared, the police ruled that Young had shot his dog and then committed suicide. However, Local villagers who had known Young disputed the conclusion that Young would ever hurt his beloved dog. Rumours started to float around that something more sinister had occurred to Young. Reinhard was taken by the case and the similarities between himself and Young. Not only had they both at one point owned the same store, but if Young had killed himself, then both were going through troubled times. He decided to base the main character in his novel on an amalgamation of Young and himself called Guy Gypsum. Reinhard's daughter, Tiffany, said that her father struggled to separate fact from fiction, and this possibly explains what happened next. One week after Young's body was found, Reinhard set off to climb to the top of the nearby Pendleton Mountain. Climbing the mountain was a six-hour hike, and Reinhard had set off in the late afternoon, meaning he would be walking through the tough rocky terrain at night which was known to be inhabited by wild animals. This was particularly alarming given Reinhard's lack of experience climbing mountains and his prior fear of heights. Reinhard did not return that night and the next day over 100 men equipped with trained dogs and helicopters began to search the site for him. The search became one of the biggest in Colorado history and was only called off when a plane involved in the search crashed, killing one and injuring another. Reinhard was never found. Following his disappearance, people began to question what had happened to Reinhard. There were two main theories. The first theory was that Reinhard had been attempting to mimic what had happened to Young. 
In the last page of his novel manuscript, he had written about how the main character was setting off to walk towards the lush, shadowless Colorado forest above. Reinhardt might have been trying to live the events of the character before writing it down. Some even believe that Reinhardt is still alive, but after learning about the crashed plane that had been searching for him, decided to flee. In fact, there have been multiple reports of sightings of Reinhardt in countries like Mexico since his disappearance. The second theory is that Reinhardt was a victim of foul play. Reinhardt's own son Kai supports this theory. He believes that Jung was harmed by somebody and Reinhard suffered the same fate. He suspects that the shop that both men had owned might have put them at risk. Others argue that if Jung had been killed, the person who killed him would view Reinhard and his interest in Jung as a threat, so would want to cause him harm. Sylvia Apps's Baffling Disappearance on July 8, 2014, Sylvia Apps departed on a five-day solo hike of Vancouver's island Strathcona Park in British Columbia, Canada. The 69-year-old left at 11am and began her trek in Paradise Meadows near Mount Washington. Her family and friends expected her to return around 4pm on July 13th, but unfortunately, she went missing. Searchers managed to find her belongings, but no trace of Sylvia Apps. Her family never heard from her again. The Strathcona Provincial Park is the oldest in British Columbia and the most significant on Vancouver Island. Its wilderness covers over 600,000 acres and has the tallest mountains on the island. The park is rugged and filled with waterfalls, glaciers, lakes and forests, making it an ideal habitat for unique native wildlife. Apps was an experienced hiker and fully equipped for her trek with navigation and emergency equipment. The last sighting of her was on July 11th, just south of Castle Crack Mountain. Her case baffled search teams because they had never dealt with the rescue operation where they discovered only the belongings. When Sylvia Apps did not return on the expected date, her family quickly reported her as missing. Various search and rescue teams and organizations volunteered to help, totaling about 170 searches. The ground teams focused on areas in the park that Apps would most likely have travelled through and utilised helicopters for additional aerial support. The Comox Valley Ground Search and Rescue, or CVGSAR, confirmed that Apps signed into the register for Castle Crag Mountain Summit on July 10th. Later that month, they discovered her backpack in a different location, containing all her belongings except trekking poles and a camera. The CVGSAR scaled the search back after a week, explaining that Apps would unlikely be able to travel far without supplies in the heat and rugged terrain. They believed that expanding the search coverage was a waste of time. Apps' hiking route is popular, so if there were clues, it would not take long for someone to discover it and resume the search. Her family did not stop searching, though. The search and rescue team suspect that Apps suffered from an injury or medical emergency and could not get help. She was hiking during summer with extreme heat, so it is possible that she suffered from heat stroke and was unable to think rationally and wandered off instead of waiting for rescue. It is now seven years later and Sylvia Apps is still missing. FP Shepherd Yosemite National Park Disappearance Yosemite National Park has been home to many a mysterious disappearance, with dozens if not hundreds of missing persons cases dating back to 1909. With huge expanses of open terrain, finding people in Yosemite backcountry is not always a given. Records show that some people are indeed found, other times only their remains, from people falling to their fate, freezing and even drowning. However, in many cases, people disappear completely, with no trace, no camping gear, no clothing, no clues, nothing. The very first recorded missing persons case in Yosemite National Park was June 17, 1909. Recorded many times in the history books and archives, one F.P. Shepherd apparently went on a hike that afternoon with two female companions. They soon grew tired of the walk and left Shepherd to himself. Instead, they went back to the Glacier Point Hotel to wait. And wait. And wait. According to reports, 
It was a foggy day to begin with, and Shepard was headed for the Yosemite Cliffs. When he did not return to the hotel and to his female companions, the hotel staff were notified, and in turn, the park authorities too. The next day, US cavalry riders set out to scan the nearby grounds, checking trails, meadows, and canyons alike. Doing everything they could to try and find Shepard, they even risked their lives checking cliff faces with grappling hooks and rope. However, still absolutely zero trace of the man. Shepard was never found. After a few days of searching, efforts were withdrawn as local park authorities concluded there was no way he could still be alive. It is still not known what happened to Shepard, and considering we are now in 2022, it would be almost impossible to find any clues or evidence now. The best theories from the time suggest that with the heavy fog, Shepard got lost and panicked, and perhaps ran off one of Yosemite's cliffs. However, even this cannot be verified, as neither his body nor any other clues were ever found. With Yosemite home to many other unsolved disappearances, it must be remembered that amidst the natural beauty and allure of solitude, there is also a more eerie, haunting side to the National Park. But what do you make of these mysteries and disappearances? Be sure to let us know your thoughts in the comment section below and help us by growing this community while working to solve these unexplained mysteries. Thank you for watching and don't forget to subscribe for more videos.